Once again, it gives me great joy to greet you in the name of the victorious, risen Lord of all, Jesus the Christ. He defeated sin and death, and he's opened the kingdom to you and to me and to the whole world. And in his great name, I offer this message to each and every one of you today. Amen. Today is part four of a sermon series that I call Delicate Relationships. And today the title of the sermon is United We Stand. Uh, I want to share with you, I had a, a very interesting childhood. And I can uh, look back on this and laugh about some of the things that went on back then. It was pretty crazy because when it came to united parenting, my parents were on the complete opposite ends of the spectrum. There was no such thing back then as joint parenting. There was no such thing as agreeing on how to parent the kids. I'll give you a few examples. It's kind of funny now that I look back at it. I'd go up to my mother and I'd say, Mom, may I have this or may I do that? And her answer was, go ask your father. So I go over to dad. I'm like, Dad, can I have this or can I do that? What did your mother say? Well, she told me to go see you. Well, you need to go back to see her. But dad, she said, okay, dad, can I do this? Am I allowed to? I'll think about it. Translation, no. In, in my father's world, whenever he said, I'll think about it, I knew right away. The rubber stamp comes down, no. That's it. There was, a, there was no negotiation. I knew there would never be another time to discuss the issue, and I laugh about it. There were things that went back and forth. Like uh, one time, I was a teenager. I wanted to go to the school dance, and my father said, you can't go to the dance, and I even forget why. He says, you can't go to the dance. So I'm sulking, and I have this long face. My mom says, Jack, what's with the long face? Why are you so upset? And I said, because Dad said I can't go to the school dance. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Come on, here's the money. Have a, have a good time. And now I'm in this awkward position because if I take the money and go to the dance, I know my father is going to be upset because the two of us just vetoed what he said. So I did what any responsible teenager would do in that situation. Take the money and run. I ran to that dance with the money in my fist because I didn't want anybody vetoing this decision one last time. But that's how it was. Like When I was a kid, my sister and I, we were constantly being shuffled back between what mom said we can do, what dad said we can do, what mom said we can't do, what dad said we can't do. This went on and on. And I remember uh, very early on in life, when I was a young boy, my mother was famous for saying this, Jack, you are in serious trouble right now. Just wait until your father comes home. He'll have it out with you. Well, that went on and on. I got to the point where I was afraid of my own father. Because dad, back then, he was the, the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Well, what happened was, every day, you could set your watch by this. My dad would come in the house at 5.30 p.m. right on the dot. And all I remember when I was a little kid, I see these big forearms coming in the door like this. I'm like, oh no, here comes dad. And it was like a conditioned response. Whenever I saw the forearms, I ran for cover. It was Pavlov's dog, you know. It was like, oh no, forearms, get out the way. Get out of the way. That's how it was growing up. We were all afraid of my dad. He ruled with an iron fist and what he said was the ultimate word. And yet my mom would circumvent a lot of things and then we were being shuffled back and forth. I think you get the picture. I'm not complaining. I'm laughing about it because when it comes to joint parenting, they had absolutely no idea what that meant. And maybe some of you grew up in a household similar to that. Um, I don't want this to sound like group therapy. I'm just sharing some funny things that used to happen. But once, just once, I would love to hear this. Mom, may I do this? 
I would love to hear, okay, your father and I will discuss this and we'll get back to you. Well, that never happened. Never happened. United parenting. And that's the, this is my topic today. United we stand. You know, the Lord wants us to be on the same page. The Lord knows we're not always going to agree with each other on parenting decisions. We're not always going to agree each other in a spousal relationship or a parental relationship, and certainly not in work environments. We don't see eye to eye. We don't always agree. And yet the Lord is calling us to try to be on the same page. If you look at our gospel reading today, Jesus was talking about the vine and the branch. Notice that the branch is part of the vine. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He's basically saying in any relationship, we need to be on the same tree. We need to be connected the way the, the, the trunk and the branches are connected to a tree. We may not always see eye to eye, but we need to realize we're on the same team. We're on the same journey. We're in the same boat. And yet, sometimes we carry on as if we're completely separate. We're completely autonomous. Whatever happened to joint decision-making is what I'm saying. Decisions need to be made together. United we stand. And like I said, we may not always agree, but at least we can be on the same field, on the same, same playing field. Um, Jesus said, be grafted to him. Those are strong words. Because think about it, in a perfect world, you know what would happen? In a perfect world, parents would pray together about the decisions for parenting. Because think about it, if Jesus is the ultimate wisdom and Jesus has all wisdom, why shouldn't we pray for that wisdom to come to us through the Holy Spirit so that we can act more wisely? For instance, in a perfect world, a husband and wife would pray before making major decisions for the family or for their relationship. Now, you'll think I'm off the wall with this one, but, but listen carefully. In a perfect world, even corporate executives should pray together. You should be able to go into a board of directors room during a board meeting and people should say, let's pray about this. Let's pray for wisdom. Because the scriptures remind us that complete wisdom comes from above. Why wouldn't we ask for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom? So that united we stand. So that united we make decisions. United we discover what God's will is for our lives, our families, our relationships, all around. No matter what relationships they may be. And you know what we're trying to do here? We're trying to seek common ground. You've heard me speak about this before, and I'm saying it again. We are unique individuals. We don't always see life the same way. We don't always agree with each other on certain principles and courses of action and strategies. But can we find common ground? Can we meet somewhere in the middle in all of our relationships, whether they be at home, at work, at school? Can we find common ground, give a little, take a little, compromise, negotiate? Because that's really the secret to successful relationships, finding common ground. I want to tell you a story about a congregation in Connecticut. They have a rule on the church council up there in Connecticut. They say that every decision we make must be a unanimous decision. Every council decision. That means if somebody makes a motion at a council meeting, they discuss it, it comes down to a vote, even if the vote is nine to one, it doesn't get approved. How would you feel if you were one of the nine voters and the clear majority, no, nope, has to be a unified, unanimous decision? You know what their argument is? The argument is the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit is not divided in any way. Paul reminds us one faith, one Lord, one baptism in fact, that expression appeared in our first hymn for today. The church is one foundation. 
Paul says, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And this congregation up in Connecticut, in Connecticut is saying, we have one spirit. And the spirit is not divided. So we need to tap into that one unified spirit. But I'm not saying I agree with that decision, though. How would you feel if every council meeting you're stalled because it's nine votes to one or eight votes to two? Do you ever get anything done? Can you imagine? Do you remember that movie years ago called 12 Angry Men? Remember that? They're on a jury and it's hot. They're sweating. They can't come to an agreement. Guy, guy is saying, this could go on all day. We're driving each other crazy. Does every decision have to be unanimous at home, at work, in the corporate workplace? No, it doesn't. Because we're in delicate relationships. We don't always see things eye to eye. We can agree to disagree. Sometimes it, it's a matter of tabling a discussion until later and coming back and rediscussing when cooler heads prevail. We know the wisdom in that. But can you imagine being in any organization where they say it's a unanimous decision or we don't do it at all? Can you imagine going to Washington, D.C. right now and expecting our congressional representatives to have a unanimous decision on everything? Come on, nothing would get done. There would be no legislation passed. You know what Washington is like today. Whenever one side of the aisle makes a proposal, you know the other side of the aisle is going to disagree. Or if the other side of the aisle makes a proposal, the other side of the aisle is going to disagree. It's the way we are. Some would say that's the beauty of a republic. What I'm adding here is we're all created differently. And yet we're all part of the, of the united family in Christ. We need to find common ground, and that can be very, very challenging, can it not? So what happens if you're in a situation where you're not agreeing with a group or you're not agreeing with somebody in the family, you pray about it, you pray some more, you go away, you talk about it again, and nothing seems to happen? What do you do then? Well, let me make some suggestions about avoiding some common pitfalls in communication when you're at a, a situation of disagreement. And they're listed on the monitor today. The first one is avoid always and never words. Avoid the words always or never. Those are absolutes. I worked with somebody years ago, and she came up to me and she said, you always have that look on your face. And I said, really? Always? I always have that look on my face. What look are you talking about? Is it this one? <laughs> now, that was extremely immature on my part. And I, I confess that was a stupid way to answer. But think about it. If you use language like always, do you mean to tell me the other person is always the way you describe them to be? I don't think so. Or how about the wife who says to the husband, you always side with your mother. You disagree with me, whatever your mother. You always, always. I'm like, really? Is it always that way? Or the other, the, the other extreme. You never, ever agree with anything I say. Oh, okay. Never? Is that really the case? So what I'm saying is when you're at loggerheads, you can't agree on something, try to avoid the absolutes, the words always, Never, because how many times is it really like that consistently? Always and never? So try to avoid that if you're trying to come to common ground. The second thing you want to avoid is name calling or labeling. Now this is common sense, isn't it? But don't we resort to that in moments of heated debate? Years ago, I was watching a show, Everybody Loves Raymond. Remember this show, Everybody Loves Raymond? Well, there's this one episode where Deborah is yelling at Raymond, and she goes, you idiot, what were you thinking? He answers, why are you calling me an idiot? And she goes, because you are. And I'm sure that's a productive way to have a conversation, right? <laughs> 
When, when you call somebody an idiot, do you really expect a productive resolution from that conversation? I mean, I don't know about you, but if somebody calls me an idiot, the wall goes up right away. But that's Deborah to Raymond. You idiot. Try to avoid name-calling. It's common sense, but sometimes in the heat of the battle, you know. How about when um, a husband says to the wife, you're just like your mother, and that's not said in a complimentary way. Or the wife says, you're just like your father, and you know the wall just goes right up. How can you, how can you make headway after, after that introduction, right? But a lot of people do that. They resort to name-calling. So avoid the always never, avoid name-calling, and finally avoid the silent treatment. Were you ever in a situation where things get so out of hand that everybody stops talking? Were were you ever in a a corporate situation where this department head decides, I don't want to talk to that department head, or the wife says, I'm not talking to you for a while, or husband, you're not, we're not talking. I saw a model of that wonderful behavior also when I was a kid. Every once in a while, mom and dad would have a knockdown, drag out, verbal disagreement. And they would decide, well, then we're not going to talk for a while. So the silent treatment went on, and it would go on for days. And they only spoke to each other when it was an absolute emergency. Like at the kitchen table when my father would say, Betty, Pass the sugar. This is when they're not talking. Betty, pass the sugar. She answers back. You forgot to say please. Okay, Betty, please pass the sugar. Okay, if that's the way you want it, here's your sugar. Enjoy. You know, I mean, this is what back and forth. And eventually, uh, they would hug and kiss and make up and everything was fine. But for a long time, it was silent treatment unless it was absolutely necessary. Now, I say, in my observation in life, sometimes the worst words are the words you don't say. The worst words are the words you don't verbalize. When you don't say, I'm sorry. Or when you don't say, can we talk about this later? Or when you don't say, I apologize for calling you an idiot. Or when you don't say, can we agree to disagree and try our best to work it out? Sometimes the most valuable words are the words never said. If you're in a relationship that has its moments of tension, moments of anxiety, moments where you just can't seem to agree, isn't it better to try to talk it out than to walk away and just allow it to fester and fester, never to be revisited again? We all know that sometimes you do need to walk away and let things settle down, but as long as you agree to come back and talk about it again, when your blood pressure is lower, when cooler heads prevail, it's a lot more productive then. Relationships in this world are very, very delicate. You and I agree. And it seems that people today are more polarized than ever before in history. People are outspoken about their disagreements. And not only do they disagree, but then they make the other person look like a monster if that other person doesn't agree. Relationships are delicate. Relationships are fragile. That's why Jesus said, remember, we are grafted together. I am the vine, you are the branches. We're all in the same boat together. Why not try our best to work it out? Why not talk it out? It's not always going to be easy, but we can give it our best shot. We can be level-headed, faith-filled, prayerfully considering what we're saying and what the other person is saying and giving the other person the benefit of the doubt. I'll say once more, we are clearly 
created by God as unique individuals. We don't always see eye to eye. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Lutherans are from a different galaxy altogether. But somehow, by the grace of God, we figure it out. We work it out. You've heard me preach from this pulpit something that amazes me beyond measure. What amazes me is what Jesus said just before he died. The night before he died, he prayed that his followers would be united, that his followers would be together, that his followers would be as one. And here we are, 2,000 or more years later, and look at all the fragmentation. Look at all the Christian denominations. Just go down the street, you're going to see a Methodist church, a Baptist church, Catholic church, Lutheran church. Are we all together? Actually, we are. We may not always agree on how to worship. We may not always agree on what the Bible is saying. But when push comes to shove, we are grafted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you identify with the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, Methodist, Baptist, it doesn't really matter. Because you are part of the vine. Jesus is the vine. You are part of the branch that grows from the vine. It's not a perfect world. And that's why there are different kinds of churches and different ways of looking at things. But at the end of the day, what do we agree on? We agree on what St. Paul said and what he wrote. Almost 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote, we still have one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God of us all. But in the meantime, let's handle our relationships with care. They are fragile. They are delicate. Sometimes they do get clouded with anger and misery and misunderstanding. But at the end of the day, if we can all say we're all on the same, we're all in the same boat and we're all working to be united because the old expression still holds true. United we stand. Divided we fall. Work on being united in those relationships. To that I say, thanks be to the God of peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. And may the God of peace, peace, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.